Welcome to the final lecture on the history of contemporary literature. As I promised in the previous lectures, today we're going to delve deeper into this second important movement, the movement known as postmodernism. This lecture will have three parts. We will begin with the definition of postmodernism before locating its emergence in its historical context. To conclude, we will examine a wide range of characteristics that postmodernist works of literature can feature. I have integrated four quizzes into this lecture. If all goes well, you will receive prompts while the video is in progress. On the one hand, I've made use of these quizzes to make sure that you are listening actively. The last thing I want is to make you look at these videos more than you have to. On the other hand, the quizzes can be seen as something postmodernist. These questions add an additional layer to the video, so instead of recreating the illusion that this video resembles a normal lecture, you're jolted out of this comfortable illusion and thrown into a different interface, an interface, moreover, with which you can interact. It would be even better if the question you chose determined the outcome of the lectures. I'm not there yet, but can assure you that the IT people working here uh, have received my questions and are working at it around the clock. But instead of me explaining what we're about to do, let us, without further ado, turn to this idea into practice. In order to arrive at a definition of postmodernism, I'd like to begin by making a contrast with the other movement that we have discussed, existentialism. If you've paid attention to my previous lecture, the following question will be easy. If you were asked to single out the core question of existentialism, what would it be? Is the core question of existentialism, how can I know myself? This is what philosophers would call the epistemological question. Or is existentialism about the way in which I should live my life? This is the ethical track. Or finally, is existentialism concerned with where we are? In which reality do we live? That would be the ontological question. Now, place your bets. The correct answer was number two. As I've explained in detail in the previous lecture, Existentialist works of literature are meant to make us, as readers, think about the choices we've made in order to find our authentic self. It is by living an authentic life and by taking responsibility for the actions that, that we do, we can give meaning to our existence in the world. The first answer is more applicable to modernism. In modernist works of literature, we encounter subjects whose identities are torn, split and incoherent. In Virginia Woolf's novels, or Walter Benjamin's essays, we encounter people who have become estranged from their true selves. And the third answer is typical of postmodernism. Postmodernist works of literature are concerned with our experience of reality, whereas existentialist writers, like realist writers, assume that we can access the world through language. Postmodernists, like modernists, assume that our experience of reality is conditioned by the words we know and use, that reality is therefore inaccessible. But they also go a step further. Not only is reality inaccessible, the postmodernist says, we might even begin to wonder whether there is a world at all. This probably sounds very abstract at this point, so let me therefore take a step back and turn to an example. Now, as an example, I have chosen a video game. This is not meant as an illustration of how am I part of your world. I know how old I am, and I know that my attempts to talk your language only expose me as someone who's out of touch. Some of you know my days playing video games uh, ended with Half-Life 2, although I've tried to keep up with what's happening. Now, the fact that I'm choosing a video game as an illustration matters for a different reason. As I mentioned at the very beginning of this course, in contemporary literature, traditional genre conventions are broken down. We see the emergence of new hybrid forms of literature in the same way that we see how authors visibly begin to embody different roles. The game I'm going to discuss right now, very briefly, does so in a strikingly original way. The game I've chosen is called The Stanley Parable. Its title may seem like an oxymoron. On the one hand, the word parable may make you think that you're going to experience a story of biblical proportions. On the other hand, the word Stanley makes you think the game will revolve around a man whose name seems quite ordinary. Uh, this is indeed the case. Stanley is no messiah. 
He works for a big company in a big building where he's known as employee number 427. His job is to push buttons on his computer. He's given orders which buttons to push, which buttons to push, when to push them and how often. This is what Stanley does day after day until one day no orders come and Stanley ventures out of his office to find out why. It is at this point that you take control that you take control of Stanley, uh, sort of. As soon as you walk as a player out of Stanley's office to search for his missing co-workers, you begin to hear the voice of a narrator, who begins to tell you Stanley's story as it happens. It is where you get your first choice between two doors that the true charm of this game comes alive. The narrator tells you what Stanley, or you, did in this part of the game. What he says is, Stanley went left. But here's the thing, you don't have to go left. You can go right, or back the way you came, or not do anything at all. And the narrator will respond, often frustrated with you, for not following the rules of the story that he has imagined. At times, the narrator will even restart the game to try and force you to play the game correctly. It's in this way that the narrator some, somewhat becomes the antagonist of the game, guiding you or telling you what to do, what you did, what Stanley is thinking or is not thinking, and what the narrator himself thinks of all the choices you make as you explore the office and try to find the narrative thread. And this is how the game continues and often ends with you defying or obeying the narrator while searching for Stanley's story. Depending on your choices, you will encounter everything from a mind control facility to a museum of the game and its development. Now, why would we consider the Stanley Parable to be a postmodernist game? Why, in particular, might we see it as exemplifying a concern with ontology? As I just mentioned, the game turns players into subjects who've got no control over the world in which they find themselves. Even more, this world turns out to be one of many worlds. The narrator, like a godlike figure, is able to change the reality in which you find yourself, for instance, by slowing down time. Even more, he can transport you to alternative realities. At one point, for instance, the narrator asks whether you'd like to play a different game and transports you to a puzzle game called Portal and then to Minecraft. So the game is not about you as you try to find out who you are. That would be the modernist question. Rather, the game makes you think about where you are, about whether the world that you see is really there. From this discussion, it will be apparent that postmodernism and modernism are intricately intertwined, the fact that the post and postmodernism signals. As M. H. Abrams writes, postmodernism involves not only a continuation, sometimes carried to an extreme, of the counter-traditional experiments of modernism, but also diverse attempts to break away from modernist forms which had inevitably become in their turn conventional, as well as to overthrow the elitism of modernist high art by recourse to the models of mass culture in film, television, newspaper cartoons and popular music. Many of the works of postmodern literature so blend literary genres, cultural and stylistic levels, the serious and the playful, that they resist classification according to traditional literary rubrics. In this definition we'll see a number we see a number of characteristics that we'll turn to later, such as the blending of high art and mass culture, the serious and the playful. But first I'd like I'd like to explain a bit more about the ways in which the post and postmodernism take shape in a double barreled way. On the one hand, postmodernism builds on modernism. Both fundamentally criticize realism and referentiality. As I've, men as I've mentioned, both assume that our understanding of the world is not an objective view, but a subjective experience, conditioned and mediated by language. Think back to the stories of Franz Kafka, which present the strangest experiences in the most matter-of-fact way. Both modernism and postmodernism are also interested in and experiment with self-reflexivity. Works in both movements indeed draw attention to themselves as constructed crafted objects. Think of the play with typography in the poems of Apollinaire. And finally, both also incorporate references to popular culture, as in Diaz Eliot's The Wasteland. On the other hand, postmodernism also differs in certain ways. First of all, 
It posits that reality is always mediated. Whereas modernists assume that there is a reality but that we cannot know it, postmodernists suggest that we cannot know reality without its representation. They posit that reality and its representation cannot be separated. It's impossible to think about reality without it being represented. In other words, reality needs a representation. Without a representation, reality cannot exist. As a result, postmodern works of literature are concerned with appearances and surfaces. Indeed, one might say that they are in love with superficiality. Whereas modernists attempted to provide some kind of coherence to the subjective perception of reality by looking for some deeper, possibly unconscious structure, postmodernists do not think that there is anything beneath the surface. The appearance of reality is all there is, and that is all we need and indeed can know. Postmodernists therefore distrust what Jean-François Lyotard calls grand narratives, the narratives of religion, economics or psychoanalysis, anything really that pretends that there are invisible laws that structure reality but that cannot be perceived. In order to critique such grand narratives, in order to show the little narratives, postmodernist works of literature have recourse to irony. Instead of assuming that there is a reality but we can't see it, they play with the possibility that there is, in fact, a very different world. In short, the epistemological doubt of modernism is replaced with an ontological doubt. In the handbook, Laszlo Muncian and Pedro Lang provide a good example of such doubt in their discussion of the graphic novels by François Schouten and writer Benoit Peters, their Missité Obscure, Cities of the Fantastic. As they write, the universe Schouten and Peters have created is that of independent cities located on counter-Earth, invisible from our planet. Each city is built in a particular architectural style reminiscent of those in Europe and America. Certain buildings provide passages between the two worlds that allow travellers to explore the cities of Counter-Earth and give account of their experience. The cities of Counter-Earth thus constitute a parallel universe where architectural visions are taken to the extreme and in ultimate uniformity. Important is that these graphic novels refer back to earlier texts and buildings by Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, Franz Kafka, Jorge Luis Borges, the Belgian architect Victor Horta, and perhaps most importantly, Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities. This further development of the ideas of modernism had a significant influence on the way in which human subjectivity was conceived. As you may recall, in modernist works, human subjects appear as fragmented, split, torn, estranged from their true selves. The assumption is that there is some kind of true self to be found and this is what happens to modernist subjectivity in the postmodern era. Postmodernist works, however, let go of this assumption. They assume that there is such a thing as a true or authentic self. The self is a void, an emptiness, which can be filled in any number of ways. You might compare it to a black hole. It is nothing, even though it manages to attract all sorts of elements to it. It is this present, it is the presence of these elements that makes the contours of this nothingness visible and gives it some kind of shape. As an example here, consider Sebald's Ausserglitz, of which you have read the first pages. The novel opens as the narrator, who remains nameless, is arriving in the Antwerp Central Station. Feeling unwell, he goes to the zoo, which is next to the train station, where he visits the Nocturama. Perhaps he noticed something peculiar about the description that follows. As you may have noticed, the narrator says that his memory is foggy, but then provides a quite detailed description of what he probably saw. I cannot now recall exactly what creatures I saw on that visit to the Antwerp Nocturama, but there were probably bats and jerboas from Egypt and the Gobi Desert native European hedgehogs and owls, Australian opossums, pine martens, dormice and lemurs, leaping from branch to branch, darting back and forth over the greyish-yellow sandy ground or disappearing in a bamboo thicket. This list is followed by a reflection on the way the inquiring gaze of certain animals resembles that of certain painters and philosophers who seek to penetrate the darkness which surrounds us purely by means of looking 
thinking. Not only is this view of the human subject as surrounded by an all-enveloping darkness typical of postmodernism, Seebald also performs this view by including images of the eyes of two philosophers. It is difficult to recognize these figures, but if you're well versed in philosophy, you might identify the uh, Austrian thinker Ludwig Wittgenstein in the second photograph. The first pair of eyes actually does not belong to a philosopher, but to a painter, Jan Peter Tripp, who was a friend of Seebald, but whose face only few people will know. By thus connecting two different worlds, that of the animal and the human, Seebald creates an interstitial space, a space in between spaces, so as to make us wonder where exactly we are. Now, this is only the opening of the novel. In Antwerp, the narrator encounters Austerwitz, a historian of architecture who, as a very young child, was put on a train to England when Germany invaded Czechoslovakia in 1938 because his family was Jewish. The novel's story revolves around encounters between the narrator and Austerlitz, as Austerlitz tries to retrieve the memories from his past. The novel's main story is thus more epistemological than ontological in nature. It deals with the question, how can we know ourselves and the past? As such, Seebald's novel combines both postmodernist and modernist elements, while the narrative is propelled forward by concern with the Shoah, which, as we've seen in the previous class, was an important influence in existentialism. Now that we've got a better grasp of what postmodernism is, let us begin by to examine why it came into being. Out of which historical context was postmodernism born? Let me get this particular ball rolling by posing a new question. The question pertains to the movement of people. Did, since the 1960s, Europe solidify its colonial power? Did Europe change from a continent of immigration into one of emigration? Or did Europe change from a continent of emigration into one of immigration? If you've read the chapter by Theo Dan in the handbook, or if you know a bit about the world we live in, the answer will be self-evident. It's clear that since the 1960s, Europe has changed from a continent of emigration into one of immigration. After the Second World War, the different European powers with overseas territories finally lost their possessions. I'm here using euphemistic language. These possessions were, of course, colonies. In the course of the past four centuries, the European powers had appropriated land from native inhabitants by force of arms and claimed it as their own. These lands had served as points for colonial expansion and were populated by European emigrants. Severely weakened after the Second World War, the, Euro the European powers left the colonies as local people reasserted their own power. The colonial bonds that had gradually connected different places from all over the world were loosened. However, they did not disappear. Instead, a new kind of bond came into being, one that we could designate with the term globalization. By globalization, I'm referring to the process by which businesses or other organizations develop international influence or start operating on an international scale. We are talking about the transnational and multinational corporate tendency toward a new world order in which economic, cultural, social and political issues become increasingly driven on a global rather than a localized basis. The story of globalization has certain positive sides. The disappearance of European colonial powers and their violence is difficult to lament. The awakening of new international bonds also seems positive. It's this condition that explains why you are listening to me, why you have chosen to come international students in the ACS program in Nijmegen. But the fact of the matter is that this change was also accompanied by development of the capitalist system that brought with it a new and more insidious kind of violence. In the past, colonies were incorporated into the imperial system of the metropolis, mainly by serving as a source of goods and raw materials. After the Second World War, this dependence morphed into a new form. In the new globalized system, former colonies were subjugated in an economic way. Goods were now bought by European nations but at a very disadvantageous rate compared to the prices that European nations now asked for their products and services. For our purposes, it's important to note 
that this economic system, a system in which European countries dependent on their colonies, led to a problem with their ability to imagine a social totality. Frederick Jameson describes this state of affairs succinctly in his landmark book Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. The features of late capitalism include the new international division of labour, a vertiginous new dynamic in international banking and the stock exchanges, including the enormous second and third world debt, new forms of media interrelationship, very much including transportation systems such as containerization, computers and automation, the flight of production to advanced third world areas, along with the more familiar social consequences, including the crisis of traditional labour, the emergence of yuppies and gentrification on a now global scale. According to Frederick Jameson, it is this situation, the situation of late capitalism, that best explains the rise of postmodernism. With the establishment of a world market, any one person's lived experience no longer coincides with the truth of how the world really functions, either politically or economically. In this stage of capitalism, the truth of the limited daily experience of, say, Amsterdam lies rather in Jakarta or Singapore. It is bound up with a whole globalised system that determines the very quality of the individual subject's life. Yet those structural coordinates are no longer accessible to the imagined lived experience and are often not even conceptualizable for most people. It is no coincidence that the Stanley parable is set in an office. Stanley, or employee 427, as you may recall, is who is constantly putting in numbers without knowing why or to what purpose, is the embodiment of this kind of worker who has become completely estranged from the real world. Or take the example of clothes. Unless you are very conscious about the origins of your clothes, chances are that what you're wearing right now was made in a part of the world that you've never been to. People made the clothes from materials and chemicals that came from yet other parts of the world that they've never been to. In other words, in the very clothes that we wear, different realities are combined. The political impetus behind postmodernism, according to Jameson, is that it can make us aware of these networks, these intersections between different realities. Postmodern works provide a cognitive map. They make us aware of points of connection between places and realities that are seemingly distinct, but in fact connected. The French philosophers Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari use a good metaphor to capture this change. Whereas in former times the world was seen as a tree with the core centre, the root from which many branches grew, in the postmodern era the world has become a rhizome, a non hierarchical, hyperconnective open system in a state of constant flux and transformation without origin or destination. A good example of this imbrication of late capitalism with postmodern ontological doubt can be seen in Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities. In this novel, the famous Venetian traveller Marco Polo meets regularly with Kublai Khan to tell him of his travels and of the many cities in the Khan's vast empire that the emperor will never see. Although Marco Polo threads a labyrinthine account of his travels, the aging Khan discovers that Polo's cities are different versions of Venice. Venice, of course, being the birthplace of capitalism. At the same time, this novel tells the story of the creation of the universe. Its structure is derived from a numerical system that builds itself up, maintains and then erases itself, just as Edwin Hubble's theory of an expanding and contracting universe. The stories thus create a perpetual present in which past and future are mere dimensions and constituents. Now that the conceptual and historical underpinnings of postmodernism are clear, let us examine more closely how postmodernism has manifested itself in literature. Once more, I'd like to open with a question. In the handbook, Theodan mentioned the notion of hyphenated literature. What does he refer to with this concept? Is it the use of compound words, such as sunburnt? Is it the fact that works of literature are interculturally grounded? Or does the word refer to the fact that works of literature collapse the distinction between high and low. The correct answer here is the second answer. Hyphenated literature is a form of literature that combines an experience of different cultures. For instance, I am a Belgian 
Dutch academic, born in Belgium but working and writing in the Netherlands. As Dan shows in his chapter, the post-war era is marked by writers who move between different cultures because of the processes that I've just described. They are in between different cultures. Now, this notion of being in between two elements is in fact very typical of postmodernism. It is through such blending that readers are estranged from their experience of reality. Now, this blending in postmodern works of literature can happen on a number of levels, that of genre, that of style. Other characteristics that I'd like to discuss are the use of metafiction, magical realism, a high degree of intertextuality, and finally one that I will reveal only at the very end. Of course, not all of these features have to be present to make a work postmodern, but in one way or another, these characteristics came to the fore in an attempt to deal with the ontological doubt that was created by globalization. The first characteristic I'd like to mention is the blending and bending of different genres. Postmodern works of literature are very difficult to pigeonhole and often feature devices from very different genres and indeed different media. One of my own favorite books, David Mitchell's Cloud Atlas, is an excellent example. This book is structured like a matroshka doll. It consists of six interlinked stories. The first begins, develops, and is then suddenly stopped, just at the cliffhanger of the story. Then a new story begins, and the same procedure is repeated. Only when the sixth story comes do we get a story that is fully completed. After this story, we get the rest and the conclusion of the fifth story, then the fourth, then the third, and so forth. This novel is a beautiful example of what one can achieve with the form of the frame tale. The stories are interlinked, moreover. Important themes recur, such as the nature of evil, and also certain motifs, such as the comet-shaped birthmark that many characters share. But there are important differences between the genre of each story. The first story is a tall tale about an American lawyer who is crossing the Pacific in 1850. The second is about a young British composer in 1931 who cons a dying genius into taking him on as an amanuensis and then makes love to his wife and daughter. His tale is told in a series of letters to his lover, who later reappears as a nuclear scientist in Reagan's California in the 1970s. This third story, the Californian thriller, is the tale of Louisa Ray, a journalist who uncovers a corporate nuclear scandal. The fourth voice is that of a 1980s London vanity publisher, trapped in an old people's home near Hull, from which he eventually escapes in a marvellous piece of slapdash. The fifth story is a science fiction story about a clone slave in some future state who has acquired intelligence and vision. The sixth and central story is a post-apocalyptic one, set back in the Pacific Islands where the linear narrative began. In short, then, this novel is a curious hybrid in which the power of storytelling takes centre stage. The second trait I'd like to discuss is the combining of different styles and registers. Those modern works of literature are not elitist, they relish in the use of popular forms of culture. Cloud Atlas, which we just discussed, is a good example. Its different stories make use of the conventions of pulp literature. Another good example of such mixing can be found in the work of Haruki Murakami, whose novels set in Japan rely heavily on the model of the Western detective and on tropes from Western culture. Kafka on the Shore, a mind-boggling novel which creates more questions than it can answer, there is one point, for instance, where a Japanese ghost takes the form of Colonel Sanders, the face of Kentucky Fried Chicken. This brings us to the third element. In postmodern novels, appearances are almost always deceptive. The border between reality and fiction is constantly blurred. One way in which novels toy this notion is by incorporating fantastical elements in an otherwise realistic setting. The novels of Salman Rushdie, Midnight Children in particular, were groundbreaking in exploring the limits, possibilities and implications of such a procedure. For the sake of simplicity, I'd illustrate this, I will illustrate this aspect again with Kafka on the Shore. The plot of Kafka on the Shore consists of two strands. In the first strand, Kafka Tamura runs away from Tokyo and his father, who is a sculptor. He ends up in the provincial city of Takamatsu and is taken under the wing by a cross-gender librarian, Oshima. 
the library in which we work has a director, Mrs. Saiki, who agrees to let Kafka Tamura stay there. At night, Kafka is visited by her 15-year-old ghost. In the meantime, his own father, the sculptor, has been murdered. This murder is connected to the second strand of the novel, which revolves around an old man, Nakata, who is able to talk to cats. One day, however, this man is accosted by a man who calls himself Jack Daniels, a man who, uh, as he explains, kills cats to make flutes from their souls and he goads Mr. Nakata into killing him. It eventually becomes clear that this mysterious figure is actually Kafka Tamura's father. Guided by a feeling, Mr. Nakata slowly makes his way towards Takamatsu, held by a truck driver. Meanwhile, to escape the attention of the police, Kafka has gone to Earth in Oshima's mountain hut. In the depths of the surrounding forests, he finds the entrance to the semi-real hinterworld that is guarded by two soldiers from World War II. I won't reveal more of this novel, I'd really encourage you to read it, but I have to warn you, again, that not all questions that the novel creates will be answered. In any case, I hope that this summary gives you some idea of the possibilities of magical realism. In this light, one could also consider fantasy novels such as J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series or the works by Neil Gaiman. The story of Stardust, for instance, begins in a small town called Wall. This village is named because of the presence of a wall that divides our world from fairy, a mystical realm of magic. The very fact that every nine years the fairy market takes place on the other side of the wall, of course, inevitably, inevitably leads to the fact that these two different worlds collide. The fourth aspect that I'd like to mention ties in with the idea behind magical realism the idea that the border between fiction and fantasy is porous. This aspect is the porous boundary between presence and absence, created by the freedom of the sign. In postmodern novels, signs almost always refer not to an underlying meaning, but rather to other signs. A case in point are the Tintin graphic novels of Hergé. In these stories, Tintin is often caught in a world where not everything is what it seems. Take the Castafiore Emerald, one of the last Tintin stories. This particular story has all the trappings of a detective story. It is set in a country house where the famous opera singer Bianca Castafiore has taken up residence in order to escape from the press. When journalists call her, however, she is only too eager to invite them, so instead of seeking rest she is actually looking for attention. Professor Calculus, too, is misunderstood. When journalists ask if he knows more about the relationship between Captain Haddock and Bianca Castafiore, he thinks they are asking him about a rose that he is cultivating and which he has named Bianca. In the midst of all the chaos that ensues, Bianca Castafiore is constantly worried that her diamonds will be stolen. Now, these diamonds themselves are a kind of empty signifier. They are never seen and it's never really clear what they are supposed to refer to. It could be money, power, sex. Each time, they are supposedly lost, however, they are found to be present. On one occasion, Bianca Castafiore is actually just sitting on them. At another, she thinks that she has seen someone at a window. Tintin then looks out and says that there is nothing to be seen. In this graphic novel, then, the diamonds that draw the narrative forward are a bit like the black hole that we discussed, or the darkness that Tintin sees. They're never shown, and yet their presumed absence drives the narrative forward. Characteristic of the Tintin graphic novels is also a tendency to draw attention to the fact that one is reading a narrative. Tintin's dog Snowy often tells Tintin aloud, not that he can be heard by the other characters, that he's going to get, all, get caught up in another adventure if he doesn't watch his steps. Now, this brings us to a fifth element, metafiction, or the fact that within the story there is a reflection of the story itself. In El Club Duma by Arturo Pérez Reverte, for instance, the protagonist, Lucas Corso, continually wonders in what kind of narrative he finds himself as he is attempting to authenticate the manuscript of The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. People who resemble characters from the novel by Dumas are pursuing Corso, turning up at unexpected places. When he points out to someone that he just can't understand what's happening, his thoughts proceed as follows. He was about to add, this is real life, not a crime novel, but didn't. At this point in the story, the line between fantasy and reality appeared rather tenuous. The flesh and blood Corso, having an idea, 
a known place of residence and a physical presence, of which his aching bones after the episode on the stone steps were proof, was increasingly tempted to see himself as a real character in an imaginary world. But that wasn't good. From there, it was only a small step to believing he was an imaginary character who thinks he's real isn't in an imaginary world. Only a small step to going nuts. And he wondered whether someone, some twisted novelist or drunken writer of cheap screenplays, at that very moment saw him as an imaginary character in an imaginary world who thought he wasn't real. That really would be too much. The best known example of such metafictional procedures is probably Italo Calvino's masterpiece, Ivana Winter Nights, A Traveller. The protagonist of this novel is you, the reader, and you read the novel that the novel should be about. The first chapter opens as follows. You are about to begin reading Italo Calvino's new novel, Ivana Winter's Night, A Traveller. Relax, concentrate, dispel every other thought, let the world around you fade. Best to close the door. The TV is always on in the next room. Tell the others right away. No, I don't want to watch TV. Raise your voice. They won't hear you otherwise. I'm reading. I don't want to be disturbed. Maybe they haven't heard you with all that racket. Speak louder. Yell. I'm beginning to read Italo Calvino's new novel. Or, if you prefer, don't say anything. Just hope they leave you alone. By opening in such a way, a way that in fact resembles the way in which the narrator of the Stanley Parable is talking to the player of the video game, the novel of Italo Calvino makes itself the subject. The experience of reading the novel is taken as the subject of the novel. In other words, the novel's story deals with the novel itself. Another famous instance of such uh, metafictional procedure is a short story Pierre Menard, author of the Quixote. In this story, the narrator recites a fictitious inventory belonging to the now deceased novelist Pierre Menard. Of greatest importance amongst these works, according to the narrator, is an uncompleted piece that consists of the ninth and 38th chapters of the first part of Don Quixote and the fragments of chapter 22. It was the aim of Pierre Menard in constructing this particular work to write Quixote not simply by writing out passages from the existing texts, but by creating a new work that just so happens to coincide with the original text. But even though the words are as such identical, the narrator thinks that Menard is a superior author, whereas Cervantes merely delivers clichés and platitudes in the language of his time, Menard, he says, wrote a profound historical novel in the most wonderful archaic Spanish. A final example of metafiction that you should have heard about at least once in your life is Vladimir Nabokov's Pale Fire. Following a brief forward, forward this novel opens with a 991-line poem entitled Pale Fire by the poet John Shade. On the surface, this poem seems to be John Shade's attempt to come to terms with his own tragedy, the suicide of his beloved daughter, Hazel Shade. Following the poem, another voice takes over, the commentator, Charles Kinboat, a delightful, deluded, more than a bit demented voice who, in 200 pages of commentary and annotations on the poem, seeks to demonstrate that the poem is really about himself, Kinboat. Picking your way through these footnotes, you, as a reader, can begin to piece together another narrative, according to which Kinboat told Shade that he, Kinboat, was not really Charles Kinboat, but rather the exiled king of Zembla, a northern land where he once ruled as Charles the Beloved, until he was deposed by evil revolutionaries from whom he fled into exile. Revolutionaries who sent an assassin to hunt him down, an assassin whose bullets meant for Kinboat, mistakenly killed John Shade instead. Scholars of Nabokov's novel have been debating this novel for many, many years. Some say that Kinboat invented Shade to tell his own story. Some argue that Shade invented Kinboat. Some argue that there are other characters hidden within the story. And some even suggest that the real author is the ghost of Hazel Shade. The novel is thus a riddle, a riddle that, uh, in all probability, will never be fully solved. Uh, I like this example because I'd also like to draw your attention to the form of this novel. This novel can be seen as one of the earliest forms of ergodic literature. 
that is literature in which the reader uh, in which readers themselves can determine and decide on the outcome of the story role play video games and choose your own adventure stories are good examples of this procedure but it's also one as i try to show here that can be incorporated in, into highbrow forms of literature for other, for other examples you might want to look at House of Leaves by Mark Danielewski or S by J.J. Abrams and Doug Dost. This brings us to the sixth element that I'd like to discuss. As the previous examples have shown, postmodern works of literature are always in some way derivative. Like parasites, they latch onto an existing organism and make it their own. This engagement with other forms of literature often takes a form of intertextuality. As you may recall, Julia Christeva coined the term intertextuality to signify the multiple ways in which any one literary text is made up of other texts, by means of its open or covered citations and allusions, its repetitions and transformations of the formal and substantive features of earlier texts, or simply its unavoidable participation in the common stock of linguistic and literary conventions and procedures that are always already in place and constitute the discourses into which we are born. In Christopher's formulation, any text is in fact an intertext, the site of an interaction of numberless other texts and existing only through its relations to other texts. Consider as an example John Banville's Mrs. Osmond. As its title highlights, this novel takes its cue from Henry James's The Portrait of a Lady. The protagonist of James's novel was a penniless but intelligent American girl, Isabel Archer. She travels to Europe, escorted by a number of men, inherits a fortune, and finally and faithfully marries the dilettante Gilbert Osmond, whose motives are unsavory and indeed mercenary. Almost without missing a beat, Benfield's novel continues the story of Isabel Archer's fortunes, Isabel Osmond's fortunes after her separation from Osmond. Not only does Banfield develop a plotline that resolves certain aspects that James left open, he also captures James's voice and style in an extraordinary way. As Michael Wood put it, Banfield is drawing a different circle around similar but not identical figures, and the result is something like a jazz improvisation on a classic song, or a new orchestration of earlier tunes and disharmonies. At the same time, Banville's prestige of James's style is over the top. His novel is more Jamesian than James's own work. As such, the novel gradually makes readers think about their reading experience and about the way in which James's own work works. The pastiche, or the parody, is of course not the only form that intertextuality can take. Sometimes intertextuality can be a matter of mere fantasy. In The Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien created a complete universe with different cultures, traditions and languages. However, even here we find that these uh, inventions exist within some kind of discourse. The world that Tolkien created was not created out of thin air, but drew heavily on his extensive knowledge of Norse and Anglo-Saxon literature. To conclude, I'd like to return to the relationship between postmodernism and globalization. In the handbook, Theodan discusses three novels that deal with this new economic constellation, White Teeth, The Bridge of the Golden Horn, and On Black Sister Street. My question for you is, do these works celebrate multiculturalism? Was their reception limited to a niche of select readers? Or do they criticize post-colonial dynamics? The correct answer is the last one. Like many postmodern novels, these novels use the forms and techniques of postmodernism in order to critically address political wrongs. Kamal Dua performs such a critique in the Meso investigation. The title of this novel refers to The Stranger by Albert Camus, which I discussed in the previous lecture. In the novel by Camus, as you may recall, Meso shoots an Arab simply because the sun is in his eyes and without expressing remorse for his actions. The remainder of the novel deals with his indifference about this act of violence. Kamel Daoud retells this story from the point of view of Harun, the brother of the killed Arab Algerian, who in Camus' novel remains nameless, but is here given a name, Musa. 
If Daoud rewrites a classical novel by highlighting its troubling representation of race, Margaret Atwood often uses intertextuality in order to criticize the politics of gender. In the Penelope, for instance, the story of the Odyssey is retold through the eyes of Penelope. It concentrates on the horrible killing told in the Odyssey of 12 slave girls believed to have consorted with the suitors who were vying for Penelope's hand in the absence and probable death of her husband. For Atwood, these girls uh, had been complicit in Penelope's plot to outwit the men, and their speedy dispatch by the returning Odysseus points to their status as a mythic underclass, which our favourite heroic tales are happy to trample on or, at best, ignore. Atwood takes Penelope's part with tremendous verb, and this explores, through the figures of Odysseus and Penelope, the very nature of mythic storytelling. When Odysseus is such a renowned liar, how is Penelope to understand what he tells her on his return from his wanderings? Can you something to be untrue and still believe it? I hope that this lecture has given you a taste of and for postmodern literature. I hope that it's also clear how postmodernism came into being and in which ways it can manifest itself, not just in traditional forms of literature, but also in other media, such as video games. Now, postmodernism is a very complex subject, and I'm sure that this lecture, which was perhaps not as confusing as my normal lectures, but still, I'm sure that my lecture has created uh, questions as much as answers. So I'm very much looking forward to your queries in the discussion forum. Thank you for watching.